Okay. Um, thank you so much to Ingelisa. Thank you so much to Kunst and uh, Celia and Johan especially um, for their putting together the event. Um, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, actually. I have to say, like I, f I felt like I knew uh, these works from quite a long time ago, but actually seeing them together on a big screen, um, uh, I was just saying to Ingelisa, it has actually quite, for me at least, a very physical effect. It's almost like motion sickness. It's very, um, uh, it kind of, those, those movements affect you, you know, for me at least, uh, kind of through my body as much as uh, my, my eyes. Um, I, I've actually known Inga Lisa quite a long time. Um, before I moved to Norway, I worked at a place called Lux in London, which is a kind of agency for artists working with film, and Lux distributes Inga Lisa's work. So um, I have seen these, um, I guess all of them at some point, but mostly on small monitors um, when I was actually transferring them onto other tapes, as it was in those days, to go to film festivals and so on. Um, it's really amazing seeing them on a big screen, English. It's really, it's kind of thrilling seeing all, them all together. I, I wanted to ask, uh, to start, how is it for you to see these works together that are made over quite a long period of time, about 15 years, I, I think, about for these six films? Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, no, I think my first reaction was that, um, you know, th that was very, in a way, um, film uh, re uh, referential. It's, it's that the 16 mil um, I'm used to seeing quite small, and now with the digital um, version, it's really large. <laughs> so for me, that was, uh, I also realized how incredibly fast they are, especially the first one, kind of bombarding and uh, very much a need to sort of. Uh, interact with the environment really fast, really uh, intense, and then I suppose in a drift uh, I start to turn also work with the camera uh, with different angles and uh, mostly out of uh, boredom <laughs> in Svalbard uh, standing around and um, but then I also realized that a lot of stuff could happen uh, without actually digging in the ground, but working more with the camera. And uh, maybe uh, sort of disorientate or interact or animate the space on the screen um, uh, without kind of... Um, maybe I had been digging enough. <laughs> um, also seeing how, how they get more yes, slower or observational. Um, yeah. And uh, because you, the films often, although they're quite short, they they develop over time. So you've, I know there's they, they there's always quite an intense process. You talked about it the other day, like it was sewing. You were saying you you you'd have these sequences, and eventually you kind of stitch them together. Yeah. So and and the, also the one film tends to evolve out of something in the last one. Mm. Yeah, I always find something in one film that I want to continue. I mean, these films are kind of not one after the other. There's some bit, some other works in between. But uh, they still, in a way, I think of it maybe as one film, the whole, uh, se whole section. Uh, and, um, yeah. Maybe we can start, because I think... Um there are definitely these continuities, but also, as you say, these differences that evolve. If, if we start with the earliest ones, could, could we talk a little bit about, um, about your influences, like where you started out? Because mm. um, I, I, think, I think we can see, you know, you're, you're drawing on actually quite different traditions in mm. the films, bringing together in quite unusual ways mm. uh, these different film traditions. And I guess one of them would be this kind of Eastern European surrealist animation, in a way. And yeah, that seems, it's ticking the first two, right, in, in mm. loose and static. Yeah, I mean, when I was at art school in London, I was uh, kind of um, uh, exposed to, you know, both of these. Oh, I mean, a structural film and kind of Eastern European animation and experimental animation. But I was really um, uh, influenced by Schwankmeyer. And uh, even so that I went to work in his studio in Prague, I mean, after he had left. But, but uh, the whole, especially this thing of working with material, and uh, and objects that was very, very, but then I mean in a way, uh, the surreal 
part kind of left uh, uh, was more interested in space and also maybe conceptual art um, like um, I suppose Rachel White Reed and um, the house and the negative space and also um, the exploded shed, uh, Cornelia Parker. Uh, that was the work that I was very excited by. Maybe in in a way more than the Eastern European animation. I think it was just uh, some bits of Schrank Meyer that I was in a way brought with me. Um, and more sort of working with the structure uh, of repeated, uh, like repeating actions. Um, no. Maybe it's worth saying this actually because the in terms of the stitching together that happens in the films, like especially in the first two, I think, for example, mm. that these are actually um, quite different places and times that you're bringing together in the film because you you studied in London, but you also studied in California at Cal Arts yeah. within a way quite uh, a different San Francisco Art Institute. Right. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and, it's, and, and, yeah. and I guess that, that was quite a different environment and you were exposed to quite different kinds of practice maybe mm. or, and also your peers there were quite important to you I think sorry and, and your peers your, your contemporaries at, the, at San Francisco were, yeah. were kind of yeah, were quite yeah, yeah like the, the people teaching there I suppose that was uh, um, that was also a mix of, of people from surrealist background or, or like Larry Jordan or Ernie Gare was a structuralist film um I suppose I absorbed both bits from surrealism and uh, structural film very strongly. I mean, I still have that as kind of um, as something that I bring with me uh, further. Uh, w what about the, the way that it evolves then? Because that, that it, it feels very much in those first two, especially that, that um, I can almost imagine that the films might have gone in a different direction. You Sorry? Know, that, that the, the films might almost have gone in a different direction after Static and Hoos. Like I can yeah. kind of imagine a way in which, um, you know, because we get these traces of people and there's these quite animistic elements uh, mm. or there's the kind of wig, for example, in, in Static. There's, um, there's traces of people and, and there's a kind of, uh, objects become like characters in a way. Mm. But it seems quite noticeable from a drift that there's this, people are evacuated yeah. from the image yeah. and mm. quite conspicuously kind of kept you can almost feel how much they're being kept out of the frame. Mm. Was that very conscious, or did that just kind of evolve in that? I think work? it's just evolved, but it's also... Uh, yeah, I think I just became more interested in like the space on the screen and, and uh, a kind of disoriented disorientating space so i had to kind of clear out all the <laughs> all the clutter to make um make space <laughs> um yeah i think it, it just happened naturally i didn't make a, a conscious decision to say now uh, um, it's enough <laughs> uh, so um i guess i guess we can sort of see that happening uh with the drift and um, and you kind of move into this direction that uh, at one level we could think of as being more about landscape. Mm. But it, in a sense, I think, you know, seeing them together, um, I mean, one thing that's very obvious is that these are not coming from a documentary impulse. Mm. These, are, these, are not, these are not necessarily records of even of particular places, mm. it seems like. What, there's some kind of abstraction happening in relation to landscape. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about that? Cause the yeah, because I, I think uh, I'm very interested in... in places, in a sense, locations, but only with a view of certain um, things that can happen there or certain uh, space I can create from it. M uh, maybe it's nice actually to say where they're made, I think, because it's, yeah. it's interesting for people to have a sense of where those yeah. each of these is made. Like which one you're thinking well, of? So, so if we start with... with um, Proximity, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah example. that's shot in, in Denmark on a, on, in Skagen, I think maybe... A lot of people know that place. Uh, it's a beach at the uh, northernmost point of Denmark. And uh, I was searching for, for a really flat uh, area to make this movement, because I was experimenting with, this, with the, turning the camera and video camera, uh, with the video camera, to, and I discovered it was a certain movements happening, sliding movement. Um, and to, to get that working the most, I needed a really flat beach and also some smaller stones 
on top. So that was, you know, had to search around a lot and then, you know, in Skagen and no seaweed and sort of other kind of clutter. So, um, so that was a very particular kind of thing I was looking for. So that kind of also brought me there more than, you know, just uh, other type of interests. Mm. And, and um, so in a way it was driven by looking for this, this parallax effect, yeah, actually. Yeah, it was, it yeah. was like, in a way, uh, it wasn't that you were interested in the history of the place or that you were actually looking for, for simply for a landscape that could be used mm. to, to generate that effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's also, in a way, continued into the next films, but then there's also lots of architectural elements and, and uh, things uh, that kind of um, uh, do other things. And but should, should yeah. we just say where, where those two, the last two are shot? Yeah, so the, the second one called Parallax is, is shot in uh, Linz, on the top of a shopping centre. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I was really interested in how that, in a way, becomes almost like a science fiction spaceship kind of uh, space. Uh, it's really boring if you turn it the right way around. <laughs> I mean, all of them, if you turn, you know, look at them, it's very sort of slow going tracks, you know. It's so that kind of shift, the kind of transformation, I was, you know, very interested in. That, that, that reminds me in a way of, we were talking before, that I'd had this memory when I watched your films again this week, that Stan Brackage had made an upside down film. Yeah. Uh, shot from an L train in yeah. New York called Wondering. And in fact, of course, when I went back to, to look at it online, it's not. No. Uh, but it's, uh, he had made the film for another artist, Joseph Cornell, who was um, his kind of senior. And Cornell, uh, I think, probably had the same reaction, that actually this was a bit boring, this yeah. footage of the L train. Yeah. And so he made his own <laughs> version of the film, which was just to flip it upside down and to reverse the title. And it's definitely a better film, I think. It's yeah, kind of yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I actually really like The Wandering, just as it is. But <laughs> the, yeah. Mm. And and um, but and maybe just to, to the last one, traveling fields, because that's mm. a different location again. That's in Murmansk. Yeah, I mean that's a, a different film because that's shot in many different locations in in Kula uh, Peninsula, and that also was kind of um, I needed to have like a space in front of the camera that was completely flat to get the parallax uh, movement happening, and um, I mean at least. It happens in some of these um, uh, locations. So that also meant, you know, in around Minmarsk, it was not very flat. So I had to go in particular sort of areas that were near by the city that was kind of empty and also beside factories that, you know, I was allowed to shoot also. Uh, there was a lot of restrictions. So sort of slotted in on the flat bits. Mm. And it, it feels like what is starting to happen by these these last two films is um, maybe it's almost we're in a kind of a fictional space. Like mm. you, you mentioned the um, the kind of st uh, starship element mm. in um, Parallax, but but th it feels like there's some other kind of use of space going on here. Something that's that's no longer about a kind of site specific place or anything like that, but it's definitely more about something more speculative. Well, I guess we're going to see that in Talker as well. Mm this way in which spaces are brought together on the logic of um, formal qualities or visual qualities or mm. something else, a sensibility that's got nothing to do with uh, geographical space. Yeah, yeah, so it takes on a kind of fictional space or, or becomes a fictional space. Mm. How, how are you making those decisions? Is it, it, is it, are you gathering this material over a long period of time mm. and only gradually choosing? Is there a lot on the edit, edit room floor for these films? Yeah, I mean, most of the films are just completely completely something else than what it started off with and there's a lot of uh, so I often start with just like uh, um, an idea or a, a movement or a, with talk yeah I just started off with um, f seeing the smog in Beijing that you know it was quite interesting how it was kind of uh, blurry or how it blurred so it was very small uh, idea and then it kind of grows and um, also, I often get really lost on the way. Uh, so for me, this is, you know, the, my only motivation is to process. And that's where I find out uh, also where to go next. And also at some point I have to uh, often to find or impose some kind of structural element. And uh, so, yeah, so it's the kind of structure comes compared 
if we compare it to structuralist films, then um, I come into the structure kind of backwards. Uh, I never have a structure or a, f a fixed idea beforehand. And I think that's uh, the whole idea for me. Mm. So d maybe we can talk just a bit uh, about that relationship to, to the structuralist. So I don't know how familiar people are with with this body of filmmaking. It's particularly, I guess, in it's mostly, I would say, Anglo-American, a yeah. bit German, 60s, mm. 70s. Uh, and the stereotype would be it's very rigorous, almost al algorithmic, yeah. that you have a kind of formula. Um, it's very anti-illusionistic, so you're not you're kind of denied all these pleasures that you would normally get from narrative feature films. And it and and there's a kind of some kind of rigorous structure is set in place and then followed. It's mm. not quite true, but in yeah, but, but that's, that's the kind of cliche of yeah. it in a way. But th it, it seems like that there are these other aspects of structuralism which it seems like you do um, relate to, like for example this this reflexivity about film, about about making the audience as it were, very aware of their role in constructing the film and mm. the image. Could you say yeah, a bit about yeah that? I suppose uh, I find that um, I play with that, I think. Also, it, uh, or sometimes it's just stuck there, you can't uh, get away from it. Like in Hoos, where you see the cables, uh, uh, when the wall is falling down. I couldn't, I mean, now you would just, you know, erase them. But then, because that's you, decon that's you pulling the walls. Yeah, down. we're just holding, animating, uh, bit by bit, the, the falling. Uh, but there was no way of, of 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 hiding the cables, and that I thought, you know, it's interesting, and that's also in a way refers to the mo the making of the film, and uh, like the structuralists kind of um, do sometimes, um, kind of make the. F the film is about the making of the film. Uh, so that's certainly references to that. And also, I think that's something I like to play with. I, I, I was struck once again in, um, in Parallax by, by the snow. Mm. And that moment when the film has kind of trained us, uh, you know, that we're in these tracking shots that are going to go kind of right to left. Mm. And then suddenly we maybe notice that the snow is kind of falling upwards, basically. Yeah. And that, and then we have to figure out that okay, that means this whole shot is backwards, and it's you know there's this the, these little cues for the audience that in a way they have to do they have to reverse engineer some of the processes yeah, yeah. that they're seeing. Mm. No, uh, and also that those kind of things often happen by accident. I mean that was because uh, all the shots in the uh, the trilogy they are going from or well, shot left to right, uh, and that was a kind of uh, rule. And uh, but then I often ran off a bit of film at the end of the end of the track just to have some, and then we were pulling the camera back to start to do another shot. But then the camera once was running, so then the ca the the shot kind of then afterwards I thought, oh, that's interesting. We filmed the snow uh, in real time. Uh, so then it could just be reversed, and then it goes left to right, but then the snow comes out of the ground. And then I had to put that before the one where the snow is coming upwards, otherwise you would kind of know. But when it's coming out the right way, you don't think about it. I, I don't know, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Maybe. And, uh, and in a way, you know, these films really reward this kind of repeated viewing because the, for example, you were saying with, with Hoos also that you had three cameras, I think. Yeah. Mm. And that one of the reasons that um, you still were working with these kind of mini rules in the process, right? So you, we get, um, we get one whole roll from one camera mm. and then one whole roll from the next camera, even though they were shooting at the same time. Yeah. So that's why the house sort of yeah. uh, is going up and down in a way it's weird. yeah it's kind of um and that's also something that was a bit accidental because and became a kind of way of structuring the film but uh, we brought kind of uh, three cameras because we were worried about uh, there was no electricity there and it was middle of nowhere so we had to have at least a few cameras to cap make sure we capture the event <laughs> or the <laughs> animation so um uh but then when I got the footage back, uh, I realized that this is a way I could structure 
so it goes back and forth in time, became like quite um, an interesting, meaningful um, thing to think about, like a rap or uh, at least or also, I mean, this film, I think, is so much about time anyway and process. And then you have this thing going back and forth in time, uh, kind of, um, yeah, like a stru uh, st structure, structurally element. Absolutely, and, there, and there's, there are all these kind of layers of time happening, like the the sequence with the the sun from the window crossing the wall, um, which is obviously time lapse, and you can mm. tell it's accelerated. But you can also see that somehow between those shots, that the wall, the the paint on the wall is flaking or being flaked off by mm. you, obviously. Yeah. Um, but so you get these two somehow different layers of time compressed into every sh in, into every mm. frame. Mm. Yeah, no, I also, I mean, I also find that really interesting to work with, with the, uh, yeah, two different time scales, or uh, also the animation is often kind of trying to imitate real uh, time. I mean, of course, the house is not, it's imitating some strange, speed it up even more than the time lapse, but uh, the tracking shots, for instance, they uh, are constructed to appear as running in real time, like a real tracking shot might be. And then, of course, the, the time lapse flickers and goes, the shadows go fast. And so playing with those two time scales, I found really, you know, also interesting. Mm. Absolutely. And I'm so aware of time. And there's a couple things I, I really want to ask. One um, that sort of relates, I think, to this, these questions of process is about sound. Sound. So, yeah, yeah, and about the sound design. Because um, sound is such a big part of these, and especially their kind of, um, the, the kind of spaces, the fictional or kind of emotional space they create, that the sound is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but you've worked collaboratively a lot on the sound and in quite different ways. So I, I was wondering, actually, if we could compare two specific examples, mm -hmm. one being Adrift, which is the, the film in Svalbard, um, and then the last one, Travelling Field. So Adrift, you worked with Fahad... Country, mm. is he on the soundtrack? And it's Stirla Einerson that helped on Traveling Fields, I think, with the yeah. with that sound design. Yeah. But they they're both um, completely different processes, but they also I think have quite different effects and relationships to the image track. Mm. Could you could you talk talk about the, those two? Yeah, yeah. The 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 one in in Svalbard is is just based around one uh, singular recording of of uh, um, it was just a microphone put in to the window, crack in the window during a snowstorm. So very, just a hiss. Uh, so that was, you know, just one real time recording. And then it sort of worked uh, some uh, elements of other wind into it a little bit, but very simple. And also somehow thinking that it might uh, seem like it's eroding or, or working against the animation in some way because that's kind of constructed time, and then the the real time of the of the recorded recording. I thought also that to juxtapose those two. But in traveling fields, um, it's very com complex uh, soundtrack because any or any sound that was you try to put on those uh, upside down track uh, the three last films, really came into conflict with the image. It's very um, hard to, to, to put sound to it. I, in a way, wanted to keep them silent. Uh, but then with Stula, he was uh, found a way that you, in a way, accept, can, work, can accept the space. Uh, and um, working with those, um, oh, and he made like really long, uh, or really slow layers, loads and loads of layers, in a way uh, corresponding to the layers of sliding movements in the in the film. Um, but I think what we were trying to do, or what he was uh, interested in, is to try to make you kind of uh, think that it was real. <laughs> but and there's there's all kinds of things you were saying in the mix there that are kind of barely perceptible, like a satellite beep and mm. a Russian male choir, I mm. think. And and it's yeah. very, very heavily mixed. Ve very, very, very layered. And, and uh, I mean, I don't hear all those things, but <laughs> um, yeah. And also, the last shot is a, is a, is a, is a, the sound of an avalanche uh, that's really, really slowed down. 
like that also starts away. And I, su I suppose it, the last shot includes all the different layers of the film, earlier bits of the film. Uh, that was also some formal element. Mm. I, I really want to open it for, for questions. I'm gonna, um, but I want to ask you one last thing. Um, in a way about atmosphere and about the atmospheres of these films, and especially looking at them now, because there, there is this sometimes sci-fi feeling, but also a kind of maybe apocalyptic feeling. Mm. And I, I'm just wondering, are there, for you, is there, uh, is there a politics around these images? Is there a kind of mm. e eco anxiety in some mm. of these? Or is this, is, there, is this something that simply we might project onto them at this yeah, point? Yeah, well, well, I, I don't think about that when I make it. Um, uh, but sure, <laughs> there's a lot of anxiety in there. But I think I hope they can work on different uh, levels. I I, th I suppose I when I make a film, I, it's very I'm very engaged with the formal elements, and uh, I think like um, I think that comes first. And uh, but I um you know I I think it's good if they work on many different levels, also emotional level or um, conceptual or whatever yeah. well, we can w we can think about this maybe for ourselves also when we see the beijing smog and so on <laughs> in the next film there's um, I, um i would really like to open it out because we, we do have time for a couple of questions i think um i think we're going to put the lights up so we can <laughs> we can see you um and there's also a roving mic um, and what we'll do is um celia um can can bring the mic to you and I think what we, m we might do just because of hearing is that maybe I'll repeat the question for Ingelisa if she doesn't catch it. I should say also that I think if people want to ask in Norwegian, that's absolutely fine and we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, would anyone like to, to start? Any questions from there? Yeah, hey, <laughs> I just wanted actually to hear more about your, your methods practically. Um, because I um, I find myself thinking a lot about how you did things, um, and maybe uh, for example the wonderful film uh, Hus. If you can just tell us how how did you do that? Did you <laughs> climb up and down and take away things, and how did you make the paint go off the walls? And how long time do you spend? Mm. Okay, um, we were there for f ten days. And we were five people, I think. And it's not so complicated. It's it's the it's also quite a small, quite a small. Oh, sorry, it's quite a small house. Uh, and the layers were sort of animated or picked off bit bit by bit. Uh, and but there was a lot of I had a carpenter with me to make sure. Uh, that it didn't collapse before, so I had to loosen everything so it could be moved uh, frame by frame, and then we had to make sure that the the whole structure didn't collapse um, too early, I suppose. And then there was three cameras set up, uh, taking yeah, three different angles of the same movement, and then it was literally just using. Uh, tools, uh, like knives and, uh, you know, it's very, phys very physical, but very simple, but very methodical, bit by bit by bit by bit. And no cheating. <laughs> Was that, did that answer your question? And how much time did you spend on that film? How long did that take? How, how many days was that? 10 days. So it's not that long. And then the, the footage is also, you know, three times from three cameras. So, but there was a lot of, lot of work, yeah. More questions or comments?
Hi. Um, I'm curious you talk about your method. If, uh, could you say something about how you, what goes uh, before that when you start out with a new project? You said a little bit about it, like you had some sort of vague idea in, or some sort of starting point with some in small inspiration and you sort of grow from that. But I'm kind of curious how, how does that end up with these sort of quite big sort of productions with all these people involved and like how does it take shape? Is it that possible to describe? I didn't hear the beginning of that. So, so it's like what, what comes before, in a way that the process you've just described, for example, this intensive shooting process, what, what happens before that? Like how do you conceptualize something enough? What's the, what's mm. the process that happens before you get on mm. location or with all this, with a crew and so on? Mm. Yeah, but that's in a way, it, with Hoos, it's a very um, simple answer to that. It's, it's uh, the film before. Uh, with all the objects that uh, disintegrate and um, come back, and and uh, I sort of thought I would like to do it to a larger object, and um, but then I uh, a house that would be interesting, and uh, so travelled around in California looking for a house that could possibly be dismantled or worked with in in that way. Uh, so that's, uh, I suppose, the, it's very much coming out of something I have tested or played with or tried out, uh, experimenting with. Uh, and then, you know, uh, take it, just go for it in a way. <laughs> or, or um, yeah. It, it, it must be hard, though, with, with, for example, some of these, the later films where you have to raise money, um, uh, to you know, to take a crew on location, mm. but in a way, it sounds like you know you're very process based. Do you have to uh, over promise a little <laughs> bit, or kind of over describe yeah. when you actually don't really know what's coming out? Yeah, a lot of the time I don't know what's coming, and I, I kind of uh, make a, a kind of a plan, or I often describe a method. Uh, but I have a with the next film, the Tokya, I had a pe peculiar situation with the Film Institute because. They wanted me to, I made like a, a proposal that included process. I you know, don't know what this, where, where this is going to end up, but uh, um, a quite a detailed description of the process or the method uh, approach. But then they wanted me to write a script and uh, so that I could get um, such a big budget. <laughs> and. Uh, then I had to literally invent or say, oh, the fog will come in from the left, uh, then there will be a little building, you know, but it's totally unpredictable material. So um, that's kind of a strange part of my work, I suppose. But uh, but that was, you know, then, you know, with Helga, we just um, uh, found out that we could say this is like a possible scenario. And then they bought it. So uh, you didn't but it's have to get CGI it's to redo it. It's completely, completely something else than what I described. It's it's. Uh, mm. To the microphone, please. Uh, since you have used the uh, sixteen millimeter until your last film, uh, I wonder about the thoughts behind going into digital video so the question was about moving from 16 millimeter to video yeah I haven't really moved anywhere but back and forth between and now this last film is a mix of of, uh, of uh, super 8 and 16 and digital and I, I really think that I would like to work with digital now, without abandoning 16 mil or Super 8, but but um, it's great to that is so accessible, and so the process of the film uh, is is simple, or ish. It, it is interesting though, because because you were saying just before the screening that, for example, with static, that um, the title partly refers to to the soundtrack of 16 millimeter film, right? The, so for, for people that aren't familiar, like a uh, uh, 16 millimeter film has this optical soundtrack. And, and in a way you actually wanted this, 
this background static electricity noise that you kind of always get annoyingly <laughs> and you normally try and play down on 16 millimeter film. You actually wanted that to be sort of played up. You wanted that the audience to be really aware of that crackle and hiss. And in a way now, of course, it's showing in digital form. And Did you hear the static in there? Yeah. <laughs> Mm. But I was cute. I was listening for it. Yeah, yeah. For it, so. mm. I wonder if there's one one last question, or if um, if people are ready to enter the fog. <laughs> or Yeah, I, I basically just wanted to th uh, say thank you for for the wonderful films. It was really interesting watching watching them in a sequence. I, I just wanted um, now that they have been uh, digitalized, it seems like a really good occasion to issue them on a digital format. Uh, are, will these films be released like on? Oh, there they are, brilliant, <laughs> DVD or Blu-ray or and uh, is it accessible to? to yeah, buy them? well, yeah, they're on the DVD there, the three the upside down ones. But I don't know about um, the other ones, but they are, you know, they are in distribution of the Film Institute and also Lux in London and uh, Light Cone in Paris and these things. So it's possible to, to book them, but it's not, they also, some of them are in um, Film Bib uh, also. Mm. But uh, I'm, I'm going to do the, the advertising for you, so I'm, I'm going to tell you that these are available outside tonight. So this is the trilogy, the, the last three films we watched, mm -hmm. for a special price tonight. I'm, I'm going to say it's a special price of 200 kroner. And they're out, okay. so that's out on the front desk if you'd like to get a copy. Um, maybe that is a good moment to, to go over into the last film, to talk. Uh, um, do you want to just say anything about that? You, you've talked about it a little bit, but is there anything else mm. you'd like to add about Torque before we, uh, before we see it? No, not really. I just think I've said the, we talked about the bits, uh, about different formats. So, um, took, and it, it was produced over quite a number of years, that one. It's really, yeah, that's it's been taken a, really a long time, yeah. Mm. It's uh, mainly because it was very hard to catch the fog, <laughs> the unpredictable fog. Mm. Well, um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it on the big screen because I haven't seen it yet either. Um, I just want to say, um, uh, Ingelisa will be around afterwards in the bar if you would like to come and ask her other questions one to one or just thank her. Um, but for now, I'd just like to, to thank Ingelisa for a wonderful screening and um, thank you for thank you for coming. So, thank you to you and thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs>